following message is a presentation of Valley Metro Church, a community of believers dedicated to knowing God and making Him known. We're going to be looking at Romans 8 today, but since it's one of those scriptures that start out with therefore, we learn that therefore you have to look at what the there is there for, and you have to look at what comes before it. Last week we looked at Romans 7, had an explosive insight to some things that go on inside of us. Have you ever been in a, in a situation where there's something pretty big going on, something pretty serious, and no one's talking about it? Ever been in a situation like that? No one's saying anything about it, but it's pretty obvious. Maybe on the job, in the workplace, something's going on, no one's saying anything. Maybe to bring it a little closer to home, maybe in your family, Something's going on, no one's saying anything about it, but it's there, it's like the elephant in the room. Maybe to bring it a step closer, maybe it's going on inside of you, and no one's saying anything about it. It's like the elephant in the room. Last week, we looked at a section of scripture that talked about the biggest struggle a believer can have going on on the inside that no one's talking about. And I love this section of scripture, you know why? When I read it, I go, I have the same struggle and nobody's talking about it. And I saw the apostle Paul, this guy who's like this super apostle, he's like up here on a different level, saying I have the same struggle and no one's talking about it. And it's a, it's a reality check for all of us. It's, it's things that you know, Jesus came, he did some radical things for us, yet, yet, there are some struggles on the inside that are very real, and most folks aren't talking about them. And Paul, this great apostle who writes a third of the New Testament, says, guess what? I'm just like you. I got a struggle on the inside too. And he starts to elaborate on this um, amazing struggle. And when I read this, for me, it's very encouraging. Hopefully for you it is as well. Super encouraging. And it's so important that before we look at Romans 8, I want to look at the last part of Romans 7 so we really appreciate what Romans 8 is all about. So let's look at this if we could. Romans 7, we're going to start in verse 20. Uh, if you have a bulletin, there's a place to take notes. We're going to be looking at some profound things this morning, specifically your God-given identity. And this is an area that Paul had down pretty good. He came to terms with some things. And he made a statement. It was probably one of the most powerful statements in history that deal with the inner struggle we really have and most folks aren't talking about it um how many of you guys were here last week how many were not okay good should have been the other half but it wasn't um <laughs> uh, all that to say is this is so important to get this down because to me when i realized this i became liberated as a believer i'm i'm going on okay i'm, I'm trying to follow the lord and i believe what jesus did but Man, I got this struggle, what's going on? And when I came to this point of scripture, I'm like, wow, this is the struggle I have that no one's talking about. And Paul says, yes, I have the struggle too. And so hopefully you guys will get this. There's a lot to be, to be gleaned from this. A lot of identity to be understood. Uh, beginning in verse 20 of, of Romans 7, Paul says, now, if I do what I don't wanna do, it's no longer I who do it, but it is sin living in me that does it. So I find this law at work. When I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For my inner being, for in my inner being, I delight in God's law, but I see another work at another law at work in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within my members. What a wretched man that I am. Who will, ex who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, I myself in my mind am a slave to God's law, but in the sinful nature, a slave to the law of sin. He's talking about this very real struggle, very real struggle that we have on the inside. And the struggle is this. How many of you would agree, I do the things I don't want to do? Okay, no one's talking about this. How many would say, the things I don't want to do, I end up doing? Okay, Paul's like, yeah, me too. And I'm going, seriously, Paul? I thought you're way beyond that. 
Aren't you like in some other league? Don't you like, you know, you're, you're doing the miraculous. You're writing the New Testament. How can you have that same struggle? He's like, yeah, if everyone were to be honest, everyone's got that same struggle. And he elaborates on it, and I think we need to, to be fair, to be honest about our condition, who we are, who we're not, the reality of what God has in store, to understand identity, past, present, and future. You gotta look at this. You gotta deal with this. It's a struggle on the inside. It's a war. It's like a civil war, if you will, a civil war between the spirit and the flesh. Paul struggled with it. So do we. And Paul is telling us it can really beat you up. Because when you do the things you don't want to do, and when you don't do the things you do want to do, you feel terrible. And that's why Paul is going, I feel wretched about this. It's not like, yeah, whatever, I kind of messed up today. No, he cares so much. He's like, man, I feel wretched. This is the Apostle Paul calling himself wretched because when we do the things we don't want to do, and when we don't do the things we know what we want to do, we do feel wretched. And he, he uses terms like, I feel like a prisoner because there's this war going on and I don't, I don't want this going on, but it is going on. And sometimes it happens, I'm not happy about it. And he ends up saying as a prisoner, he goes, who will rescue me from this body of death? Most people read that and move on. We didn't elaborate on it last week because we were, had a lot to say on the topic, but this is what he means right here. Who will rescue me from this body of death? In the Roman Empire, the Roman Empire was extremely creative in how they governed and how they ruled most of the known world. And they used a lot of intimidation. They developed methods. We know they, uh, the Persians invented crucifixion, but they perfected it. They were very critical on how they were gonna govern. One thing that is noted as an early Roman Empire punishment, that if somebody were condemned as a criminal for murder, do you know what they would do? Now, if you're young in the room, you can cover someone's ears. This is graphic, it's PG for reality. But they would take the person you killed, attach that person to you, and you get to walk around with the person you killed. They tied them to you. No one can cut that off. And so your punishment was walking around with your sin and your consequences. And eventually, not to be too graphic, but this is reality, as this would decay, so would you. And eventually what you killed would kill you. Who will deliver me from this body of death? This is what Paul's saying. Paul's like, this is what I feel like. I do the things I don't want to do. I'm walking around with this stuff. I want to be free, but I can't get over the stuff I do. For example, think of it this way. When you don't forgive somebody, you carry that around as much as they carry it around. If you have an animosity towards somebody, you carry around what you hold against them. It's the same way we walk around carrying these things like Paul is talking about, this struggle. He feels condemned about it sometimes and no one could cut it off. I'd say it is the same with us. And there are certain things that can be killing us when we do what we don't want to do. We feel like a prisoner. This is the context that Paul's talking about here. When I do what I don't want to do, I feel wretched. It's like a war on the inside. And who's going to deliver me from this body of death? I got to get free from this. And when he's talking about this, I want to ask you, what do you do with your feelings of condemnation? When you do feel condemned, when you do feel like, man, I did it again. I do what I don't want to do. I am such a loser. I feel wretched because that's what Paul the Apostle is saying. What do you do with those feelings of condemnation? Because there are very real feelings that we all have. Paul had them. If you have them and I have them, we're not alone. This is something that no one's talking about. We don't talk about this often, but I think we need to. You know why, church? We're the people of the resurrection. The Bible says we're the people of the resurrection. We got the Holy Spirit power, and there's a whole new life and a whole new future. I came that you might have life and have it abundantly. And Paul's experiencing that life sometimes, but other times, other times he's walking around with this war on the inside. He's feeling wretched, and he feels condemned when he's supposed to be the people of the resurrection. I would say if we don't get a handle on this, if we don't understand this, we won't walk free. We won't walk free. You won't walk in the liberty God has for you. 
You won't walk in the power and the fullness of the new identity because we end up walking around with the old man strapped to our back in the spiritual realm, wondering why we have an ongoing struggle. Paul knew this was so real, he's been ramping up to a, a statement like this. The early readers, when they would read, who would deliver me from the body of death? He, they'd say, oh, oh my goodness, did you hear what Paul wrote? We just blow right through it. Go on to the next chapter. Paul's like, do you guys get this? Do you understand the struggle? Here's the cool thing. Paul right now goes from an atti attitude of defeat to an attitude of total victory in 2.0 seconds. Bam! And you're like, whoa! Where's the transformation, Paul? What did it come from? He's about to reveal a truth in Romans chapter eight that is explosive. This chapter changed my life. This chapter, if there's one chapter I could take on a desert island with me, if I was only allowed one, I'd have to pick this one probably. There's more in this chapter with your identity, what your identity is and what your identity is not. And I would say the greatest single deficit in the body of Christ today, the church globally, the church wo worldwide, uh, the, the people who call Jesus their savior, the, bingest, the biggest single deficit is an identity crisis of believers not knowing who they are, who they're called to be, and who they're not anymore. And because of it, the devil is fine with that. He can just kind of sit back and kind of let people be confused about their identity. And as long as they're walking around confused, he's happy. But if believers begin to understand who they are based on God, who God says you are, and who you're not because God says you're not anymore, then we walk in a whole new level of, of, of victory and destination and um, just the fullness of what God has, the abundant life. I came that you might have life and life to the fullest. This is a key component. It's identity. So let's see how Paul goes from defeat to victory in 2.0 seconds. Talking about God-given identity today. And let's start in Romans chapter 8, verse 1. Therefore, therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit of life set me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do in that it was weakened by the sinful nature, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful man to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in sinful man in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the sinful nature, but according to the spirit. Let me break this down. He's talking about spiritual laws at work. Here's the thing about spiritual laws. You and I don't have to agree with spiritual laws. We don't have to like spiritual laws. They're still spiritual laws. Whether we like them or not, or whether we think it should go differently, everyone on the earth has got an opinion about stuff. God's got spiritual laws. They are laws. Nothing is gonna change spiritual laws. They are facts of life, spiritual facts of life. One is we reap what we sow. If we sow to the wind, we reap from the whirlwind. If we sow to the kingdom, we reap from the kingdom. Reaping and sowing is a spiritual law. Nothing's gonna change about that. He's using a law here called the law of sin and death. Now this is the law, spiritual law. Again, you can have a different view on it. You can you know, have a different opinion on how it should be, but God says this is a spiritual law. Spiritual law of sin and death. Sin leads to death. Sin leads to separation from God. We see that in the garden with Adam and Eve. As soon as they sin, boom, separation. The ultimate picture in the end of the book of Revelation, separating sheep from goats, wheat from chaff, sin leads to death. It's a spiritual law. And he uses a term called condemnation. And condemnation is literally when someone gets the death sentence. And under the law of sin and death, Condemnation is a reality. That's what he's saying here. It's a reality for everyone. And even though this is a heavy load in the life of everyone who ever lived, he is telling us here that all of the law in the Old Testament, all the law, the prophets, everything ever written, all the regulations, there's nothing in there and there's nothing we could have done to set us free from that law of sin and death. You can try as hard as you want. All the offerings, all the sacrifices, couldn't take away our consequences. That's what he's saying. And that's why we feel condemned sometimes. It's a very true feeling that people feel. But this is what, where he goes. And that's why people feel wretched. Because you're like, hey, I feel this thing and what am I gonna do? I mess up and I feel short. And this is why there's a feeling of condemnation. Enter Jesus. Enter Jesus. Everything changes with Jesus. He did 
what all of the law and the Old Testament prophets could not do. It says that God sent his son in the likeness of sinful man. God's son took on an earth suit. It's God in flesh. He became this final sin offering. His one single act of kindness changed the universe for billions of people. One single act of kindness, this is how profound it is. And what he did is he set us free. You know why he's saying set free? He just talked about the body of death. He just talked about the body of death that he feels like he's walking around with. Who will deliver me? Nothing could, the law could not do it. The prophets could not do it. Nothing could do it. I would try to do more good things than bad things. I would try all these things. I tried under the law. Paul was a Pharisee, man. The guy knew the Old Testament law. He tried to live pure, set apart. He's like, nothing worked. Who's gonna set me free? Jesus set me free. He cut off that body of death. You need to know something today, church. That feeling you have on the inside sometimes, the one that beats you up, and you know what I'm talking about, the one that eats you up, the one that beats you down and makes you feel defeated, that one, you know what I'm talking about, right? The one that he's talking about here, the wretched, oh, what a, you know, I got this war and I'm a wretched person, that, that voice, you need to know something. That old man was cut off. You need to walk free of that because that's not the spirit of God. Who will deliver me from that body of death? You need to say to yourself, Jesus set me free to it. If I hear it, it ain't him. If I hear condemnation one more time in my life, it is not him. Why? Because there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You gotta know that, church. No condemnation. Conviction? Conviction's good. Condemnation is bad. Conviction is the Holy Spirit going, psst, psst, hey, what do you say you go left here instead of right? Conviction is the Holy Spirit saying, hey, why don't you take the high road on this one? Convictions, the leading, the prompting, spirit. Condemnation, no. It doesn't exist anymore. You've been set free from that. And if it comes up, there is another who tells you to be condemned. There is another, he's called the accuser. And we went further with this last week. If this topic is something, you know, go online, it's on iTunes or on the website, you can get more on it. But the accuser is the one who wants you to think, you are condemned. Look what you did, you're wretched. And if we're not careful... And if we're not taking every thought captive, you and I can stay in a stuck, debilitating place like that. Paul's like, believe me, it messed with me too. I too was like that. I'm too sitting in my prison cell going, this is lame. How come I'm so wretched? What's going on? And he came to terms with the power of what Jesus did, that he set me free from the body of sin and death. There is no condemnation. And it's a beautiful, beautiful snapshot. Who is this for? Who does he do this for? The ones that are willing, the ones that recognize who he is, the ones that acknowledge his gift, the ones who appreciate it, and the ones who receive it. And if you're one of those, if you're one of those, God has redefined you. You have been redefined. And you gotta know that you've been redefined. If you don't know you've been redefined, you still go off the old feeling, well, I still feel wretched. Isn't that who I am? Because that's how I feel. No, if that's you, you've been redefined. Specifically, you've been redefined by his grace. And that's our first point this morning, if you're a note taker. And you wanna know about your God-given identity? The first note is to know, I am now defined by God's grace. I didn't used to be, but now I'm defined by God's grace. God's grace has given me a completely new definition. No matter how I feel, I have been redefined and you've been defined by God's grace. And the next point to just tag along that is the second point this morning. God did, th God did things for me, but he also did things inside of me. This is important because believers recognize that back then, Jesus did things on the cross. Yes, I know he did things for me. I read that and I believe it. But what believers don't know and this is a big deficit to their identity, they don't know he actually did things inside of you. We think what he did outside of us, but we don't know what he did inside of us. And if you don't know that, you will walk around feeling wretched and thinking you are wretched, feeling condemned. And he did things not only for you, but inside of you. Um, and if we don't know this, guys, you need to know this. When you sense that war on the inside, you need to know. He did things in me, not just outside of me. You need to know that. 
Uh, when your feelings are lying to you about your reality, and they will, <laughs> later today, tomorrow, next week, they will. When your feelings lie to you about your reality, you need to know. Jesus not only did things on the outside, he did some things on the inside. You need to know that. And when you're forgetting about your God-given identity, which we're capable of any day, you need to know that. He did things on the inside of me. It says specifically in verse three, he didn't condemn you, but he did condemn sin inside of you. In other words, you're not the enemy when you feel like you are. Sin is the enemy. Paul said an amazing thing. He said, when I do the things I don't want to do, he had a conclusion, guys. He goes, it's not me. When you feel beat up, when you feel wretched, when you feel like you're losing that civil war, when you feel condemned, he goes, it's not me. It's sin in me. Here's the revolution, guys. It's not me. It's sin in me. We went further with this last week, but know this, please. Don't hate yourself, but do hate the sin. Hate the sin with a holy hatred. God does, that's good. Hate is okay if it's properly addressed. And when it's addressed towards sin, God hates, that's good. That's healthy, that's good. But don't hate yourself. You're supposed to love your neighbor as your self, as yourself. You don't hate yourself when you feel. Paul was starting to tip on this one. Feeling wretched, feeling condemned. Who will deliver me? And then he lands on the right side. It's not me, it's sin in me. And I know who I am because God did things in me. But you know what? I'm gonna start hating that sin. I'm gonna find out where that sin's getting in because I don't want it in me anymore. It's gonna mess me up. It's gonna make me feel wretched. So now the war is directed at the sin and the source of the sin and not at yourself anymore. There's liberation in this. You know, there's a lot of people that deal with depression. I believe that to can... Stop taking medication and be free in the spirit if they understand their identity and the renewing of your mind and taking thought captives. Greater are the things that are unseen than the things that are, are seen. Um, radical stuff here on identity, guys. And so uh, you gotta separate sin from self and hate the sin. Uh, he also didn't ask us to earn righteousness. This passage said he became righteous for you. He became righteousness for us. This is liberating too. It says the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us. Well, I thought he did that outside of us. He did. He was the perfect sacrifice. But he also did some things so that he could meet them in you. And what that means is through what Jesus did, God looks at you differently than you look at yourself. We, we don't realize how the Father looks at us. We think when we mess up, God's thinking, oh, we're such a loser. I messed up again. He probably, you know, he's probably looking down at us. No, we might be comparing him to our earthly father. The heavenly father doesn't look at you that way through Jesus. Through what Jesus did, the, holy, the, the heavenly father, he looks at us different. He looks at us as forgiven, justified, and sanctified, not as sinners. It's kind of like this. We deserve the hammer, but we get the hand. We deserve the hammer. God's like, I don't have a hammer for you. I have a hand for you. You're thinking, how could that be? See, that's what's so amazing about his grace. Think of the prodigal son. He loves his son. Son's like, whatever. I got other things to do. I want no part of this. Give me my stuff. I'm out of here. He goes partying, living large, squanders everything, ruins his family reputation, destroys everything, his future. He comes back so tainted from sin in a messed up world. The father could have said, son, you earn the hammer. Deal with it. Father's like, I don't have a hand for you. I got two hands for you. Come here, son. Bam! Puts a hug on his son, puts a robe on him, slaughters the fattened calf. This is the heart of the father that we serve. Even though you feel, look where I am and look where it's got me. I'm such a loser. I'm wretched. God's like, no, come back. You're not. I got a party for you. I got a celebration. You don't understand how I see you. There's a lot of people who never come back because they don't know how the father will receive them back. You know that? They just don't know. If they had any idea how the father would receive him back, it would change, change everything. There's no condemnation, not anymore. You need to know that. If you sense that, if you feel like that, you gotta check that in a different category. That's from the accuser. That's not from the living God. There is no more. If you understand what Christ Jesus did for, for you, it doesn't exist. It's not part of your spiritual DNA any longer. Even if the feeling comes up, it's not a spiritual fact of life. Uh, so third point this morning is God has given us a new position and a new identity. You have a new position. We're going to talk about these positions and identities and further as we get into this book. 
uh, chapter, of, uh, chapter 8 of Romans, there's so many things about your position and your identity that he's going to clarify. But do know this, you have a new one. It's not just that you have the same old identity and you happen to have a belief that Jesus died on a cross and rose for, for you from the grave. Yes. But there's also a new issued identity and position that come along with that. You got to know that. And the fourth point is this, moving along kind of quick this morning, is that new identity, it must be received, not just heard about and, and acknowledged. It's got to be received. You see, there's people who read the book and they're like, yeah, I hear what it says, but they haven't internalized it. They haven't actually received the new position God gives you. You read about it and it's still external to you. It's like theology, understanding things and how it works, but not making it personal. Uh, God's not only got a new position and a new, a new identity, but you gotta actually receive it, not just hear about it. Because when you begin to understand who you are, what your position is in Christ, when you begin to understand your new identity, then you begin to walk in it. But if you just hear about it, it's external, it's on the periphery, it's things you've heard about, and you're not gonna walk in the victory that way. So from now on, don't live according to that old nature. This concludes a few things. In fact, this would be a good time maybe if the worship team comes up. I want to I hit on this. This is going to be our launching pad for, for next week. Um, it, this tells us, so from now on, we don't live according to the old nature, old nature, but we live according to the spirit. Um, we're not under that law of sin and death. We're now under the law of the spirit. The law, everyone say the law of the spirit. You know, when you think of the law, you think of constraints, you think of parameters, you think of guidelines, you think of rules, you think of limits. That's what the law tells us. The law of the Spirit's different. The law of the Spirit is a law of liberty and it's a law of power. God still has a direction. It's a holy direction. This is no excuse for sloppy living. But understand that the law of the Spirit is one of life, it is one of power, and it is one of liberty. And I would suggest to you the Christian life is life in the Spirit. I'd suggest to you the Christian life can't be lived without the Spirit. And I believe there's some that try so hard with a belief system. They have a belief system, but they struggle. And they keep fumbling their way through, trying harder and harder, but feeling more and more wretched on the inside. Why? They're trying to walk out their Christianity in the natural man instead of in the Spirit. And Paul is going on an explosive discourse beginning now on exactly what that looks like. You can't live the abundant life unless you walk in the Spirit. There's a whole new dimension of what we're going to be getting into, life in the Spirit. Uh, you know what's amazing about this? The Holy Spirit, so far in the book of Romans, we're at starting chapter 8 now, was mentioned four times, only four times up till now, when Paul talked about our old nature and the struggles and the stuff we go through, four times. Now that he's talking about the liberty, you know how many times? 14 times right now in this chapter of Eight of Romans, why? Because the liberty is all about the spirit. The victory is all about life in the spirit. The spirit enables, the spirit compels, the spirit leads, the spirit you know, leads us into victory. You gotta know that. So that's where we're going. The last two points are simply this. We didn't obtain our new position by our own strength. We didn't get any new position by anything we did. It was not by strength or might, it's by the power of the spirit. It's the Spirit of God leading people to the cross. It's the Spirit of God making us new of water and of spirit. It's the Spirit of God transforming the believer. No one comes to the Father. The Spirit's drawing people. Spirit draws people. The Spirit brings revelation. He convicts of sin and right. He does all this stuff for us, pointing to what Jesus did, making Jesus' words new to us and fresh to us and alive to us. So we didn't obtain our new position by our own strength. And the last one is, we don't maintain this new position by our own strength either. And if you're walking out your faith and you're trying to do it in your mind and you're trying to do it in your flesh, you're destined to fail. You're destined to stumble your way through like a Pharisee. I'm trying, I'm trying, but I keep tripping and I feel wretched, just like the Pharisee that Paul was. But when you understand life in the spirit, which we're gonna be talking about over the next few weeks, you get to understand the liberty, you get to understand the freedom, you get to understand who you are and who you're not. And there's a lot of liberty in this, guys. So I'm gonna close in prayer right now, but I wanna encourage you to get ready to embark on a journey. Get ready to embark on, an, on a journey of liberty. There's no condemnation anymore. The old man is dead. Yesterday died last night. There's a new beginning he has for his people. It is the abundant life. 
And when you start understanding your identity and walking in it, there's a whole explosive future and it's very different. It's a paradigm shift. You start to walk in the victory instead of walking in defeat. Amen. This has been a presentation of Valley Metro Church. To hear more messages or to support future podcasts, please visit valleymetrochurch.com.